Let me read to you a passage from the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 5 to 17. It's the Gospel for the Vigil of the Birth of John the Baptist on June the 24th. St. Luke writes, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well on in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's from Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 17, the gospel for the vigil of the birth of John the Baptist on June the 24th. We're led, we're led to think of the obligation, the moral obligation to believe. What do I mean? Well, you know, one of the most obvious convictions embedded in human society is that man ought to be moral. There is a moral law that must be obeyed. Yes, there is a material world out there, there are human beings, there is one's own self and one's immediate world of friends, relatives, acquaintances, daily work. All these are, we might say, concrete objects of daily experience which no one who can see, hear, feel, touch and taste will deny. If they do deny them, they have got themselves into a not-too-pretty psychological and mental tangle. The concrete material world is obvious and it imposes itself on us as a great fact to be accepted. Now, while there is and has been a strong philosophical current that restricts reality to what is empirically verifiable, nevertheless, it is universally accepted that life and the world are also a moral reality. That is to say, there is much more to the world than measurable sticks and stones and material things. Looming over all and suffusing all is the moral law, which of course cannot be seen, touched or heard. The universe imposes itself on us not only by its material resistance and force, but also by its moral demands. Though we may not be physically forced to assist a dying person before us, we are morally obliged to do so. The fact that I am able to neglect that person is not the end of the matter. Indeed, a far greater moment and power in the situation is the fact that I should help him. All this is to say that the most significant thing in life is moral obligation. This is the dominant reality before man. Let us take the point a step further and consider not merely the fact that I am obliged to do what is right, and to avoid what is wrong, which, as has been intimated, is even more obvious and striking than the obvious fact of the world itself. 
There are specific things I must do and avoid. I think we could say that for most persons, they are summarized in many of the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal, you shall honor your father and your mother, you shall not kill, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and goods, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Even those who do not accept divine revelation, the Ten Commandments were revealed by God, will accept most of these obligations towards one's neighbor as being stipulated by the objective moral law. But what can be missed by modern secular man who accepts the moral law, even if he misunderstands its foundation and nature, is one great area of morality. This is that there are moral obligations to God, our Lord and Creator. Just as there are moral obligations in justice towards one's neighbour, and, say, to one's parents, so there are moral obligations that man has towards his Lord and Father, God. This is not just a matter of religious persuasion, feeling or conviction, but of objective morality. These religious obligations of man are summarized somewhat and made specific to a point in the first three of the Ten Commandments, but man's religious obligations are not simply derived from the Ten Commandments any more than is the obligation never to murder derived simply from them. Man senses that he is obliged to acknowledge and worship God, and part of this will be to try to know the true God. As a matter of fact, characteristically, religion has been everywhere, bearing testimony to man's awareness of this moral obligation. But now, let us come nearer to our point for today. It is that a special obligation, a moral obligation of great magnitude, springs from God speaking to man. If God speaks, then manifestly man has the obligation to listen and to accept his word. Modern man tends to think that the only moral obligations are those which his own intellect will justify to him. Yes, reason is clear on the point that you ought never malign your neighbor's good name without sufficient reason, let alone harm him in physical ways. But the obligation, the moral obligation to believe, to have faith, to accept the word of God, that is a very different matter. Faith is not seen as a moral obligation, incumbent on the conscience and carrying moral sanctions, but so it is. And the entire sweep of divine revelation makes clear that the moral obligation to believe the revealed word of God is a basic moral obligation, which must be obeyed. While our Lord in his public ministry repeatedly insisted on the fulfillment of God's revealed commandments, in all that affects one's neighbour, as in Matthew chapter 25 on the Last Judgment, he was especially insistent on the obligation to believe God's word. Faith is a serious moral obligation. That it is a moral obligation is indicated by the fact that there are sanctions. All this brings us to our gospel today. Of course, to say that religious faith is a moral obligation includes the proviso that a person realizes that God has indeed revealed certain truths. If a person does not know this formally, any guilt that might be involved is mitigated. But in our Gospel today, for the vigil of the birth of John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 17, the angel reveals things to Zechariah from God. Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. This was a revelation that required faith as a point of moral obligation. The holy Zechariah failed in this at this moment, as we read a little later in Luke's text, and he was punished. Let this remind us of the fundamental moral obligation that is faith in God's word. Our eternity depends on it. 